Okay. So appreciate my lovely wife and we are uh, <clears throat> playing, uh, what's that game you like with the blocks coming down? Jacob? Uh, no. Oh no, Tetris? Uh, yeah, so our house is like Tetris. We have uh, boxes of cabinets and everything else. And so this is the only place because we had to take down our other Wi-Fi stuff in the house to where we can do this. So anyway, but hey, uh, compared to everything else going on in the world, we're we're blessed uh, more than we deserve. So, so uh, thanks again, though, last week with um, uh, I appreciate continued prayers for the firefighter families. A lot of um, things have been happening to another firefighter, as you mentioned, his uh, um, daughter, who's 23, uh, special needs, um, passed away between Christmas and New Year's at a memorial for her yesterday. So, so yeah, there's a lot going on in some of the prayer requests you have shared. Um, prayer is powerful when I continue doing that and sharing that with you that um, what do we do with everything else going on in the world? Uh, and instead of feeling stuck, we as a church family are doing um, uh, <clears throat> Daniel's prayer. That's on Tuesday night. And I would really uh, share with you just to invite friends and to stay with that. Um, and no one has to, someone says, well, I, I missed the first part, so I can't be, no, the, um, this, they can come join anytime, uh, cause the focus is going to be on, on praying, uh, as Daniel did for his people and his country. And, and, uh, that's, what's needed right now. And so that is, uh, um, my prayer is for us to, to do that, um, join on Tuesday nights at seven after Easter, um, promoting, we're going to do. A study on the book of Daniel and um, uh, during the springtime. And so just kind of uh, promoting that and um, hope you join us for that. So a couple weeks ago, we started, uh, what do we do in these times? And the Bible's given us a great example of uh, the children, the people, the men, the men of Issachar. And um, some of the, the, when you're studying like uh, the people of Issachar, uh it's uh um it's a treasure hunt and it is and trying to discover more about these people who understood the times so that why are they in the bible why did why does god describe them like this and it's an example for us to be able to look what these people did about with their discernment and their caring and understanding um and the relationship with god that they were people that knew what the nation what the country should do at the time and um, there's a great article uh, by Patricia McKinney. It's called Understanding the Times. It was written in uh, February 4th, 2017. And she has different characteristics of the uh, people of Issachar that we're going to look at um, the next several weeks. I'm going to take each one that she brought out, and I'm going to do more in depth, um, spend more time in just one of the the different characteristics that we really need to look at the examples um, and uh, not think that, well, these people were more closer to God or they were gifted in a special way. No, it's about relationship and being able to discern. So with that, I um, uh, appreciate you journeying with me in what um, we need for ourselves, our families, for our country, our world, is we need more of Jesus Christ. And the more of him we get, the more we can be um, people who understand uh, the times because God gives us that ability through his, through his spirit um, and discernment. Because as we talked several weeks ago about being a light on the hill and to be salt that doesn't lose its flavor, to be able to really reflect the love of Jesus Christ. Um, what we're looking at today is just is a car's beginning um, discernment. And a good example about discernment and awareness, um, the uh, Orlando Sentinel did a story um, that happened, talked about a waitress that saved a young boy's life um, um, on New Year's Eve. And so this couple comes in with this young boy into this restaurant where the waitress works, and the article describes it this way. They report that waitress uh, Flavarian Carvello served a young boy and um, saved his life on New Year's Eve by secretly flashing a card, a note to the young boy that read, do you need help? Uh, the waitress said she noticed the boy had scratches and bruises and that he was the only one who did not receive an order of food. 
She goes on to say, when I asked, <clears throat> when I looked at the boy, I saw a big scratch between his eyebrows. I started observing them and I couldn't, and I couldn't understand why he wasn't getting any food. And he seemed really super quiet and sad. She said she first flashed a sign at him and asked if he was okay, then another asking if he needed help. When he nodded yes, I called the police. The Orlando police credits the waitress for saving this young boy's life from his abusers. And I kind of think, wow, wish more stories like that would happen and be able to take care of folks. But I want to share with you that she had awareness. Um, and you and I aren't going to have awareness if we're pretty much um, just self, just kind of isolation, kind of uh, self-preservation. Um, we're going to have awareness that God wants us to see the hurt, uh, the people that we need to bear their burdens. We're going to have that the more we seek Jesus Christ. And the more we reach out and seek our Heavenly Father and ask for prayer, uh, and, and, start, and in prayer and asking Him to show us um, what to do and have that understanding. And it may seem uh, like, why in the world, as the book of James says, um, if you need, seek wisdom, ask God, he will give it to you. Well, why do I want to have wisdom when all this stuff is going around the world? I just need to take care of myself. And that right there is the trap that really leads to destruction. That right there is a trap that keeps the church from being an influence. And so <clears throat> when we look at this, her actions, the waitress's action exemplified the character of the tribe of Judah, excuse me, the tribe of Issachar. And you, you think that that, here it is, New Year's Eve, she could have been focused on, man, it's busy, it's crazy, or she could have been on, you know, it's New Year's Eve, I'm here working, you know, her, you know why, I wish I could be out with family and friends, but instead, her awareness was in the present, where she was at, what she was doing. And that really is key that with the power of Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, God, our Heavenly Father, if we if we are staying close to him, we can have a power of presence in people's lives. And that's what the people of Issachar did. But to look at this it, and the actions of what the waitress did, they really exemplify the people of Issachar. And once again, when we come across the people of Issachar, predominantly is First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. We talk about these men, these, these family, this tribe came and they joined David uh, because they realized that Saul was not seeking God and David was going to be the next king. And by supporting David, David was able to have more of an influence and later become king. And it's interesting to know that David became king of Israel without killing Saul, without doing anything again, bringing harm to him. And so that was something to look at. The men of Issachar realized that, that every instance David was seeking God. And so they were men and women who sought God also. The tribe knew what to do. And here's something I want to share with you about their characteristic of who Issachar is. The tribe knew what to do because they were burden bearers for the nation of Israel. And we're going to get into this more, is that um, they knew that Saul was not a good king and David had emerged as a godly leader. He was the king Israel needed during those turbulent times. The sons of Issachar knew exactly what to do. All tribes should come together and crown David as king. And so every generation needs people who can understand the times and know what to do in light of them. So that means instead of looking at the circumstances, we need to look at the God who takes care of the circumstances. There's a, a quote I have in my office at work. And it says, uh, don't, don't scream about how big the storms, it, the storms are. Just tell the storms how big your God is. And I like that because often I'm looking at, man, here's a situation or that, when I need to be looking at the God who stills the storms and calms the seas. And so we do that when we seek God and God speaks to us. And next week, we're going to talk about how God speaks to us and and God's word and how the, the people of Issachar followed God's word. I want to share with you is that um, when we talk about God's word, it's not just a matter of simply understanding the Bible, as crucial as that is. Rather, 
It's knowing how to apply the truths of God's word to the issues of our day. And so I brought up to you that um, the tribe of Issachar, the burden bearers, and we're going to look at that. And how we're going to look at that and understand is just Issachar's name and the blessing of his father. So the significance of the tribe of Issachar helping David, we see in uh, the book of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 12. But I want to go back all the way to Genesis where Issachar uh, uh, is born into the family in, in one of the tribes of Israel and how that happens. So um, really to sum everything up about what Issachar was born into and his family, I have a dear friend. His name is uh, Tony Powell. He's a chaplain, colleague with me. And he has a phrase, and the phrase is, it's a hot mess. And, and um, what I'm sharing with you is that is what Issachar was born into, was a hot mess. And so you have the patriarchs of Israel, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And um, Isaac uh, was, he and his wife were told that the youngest would rule over the oldest. And um, the parents didn't follow that. They each had their, their special, you know, they each took a boy and, and said, this is my favorite, which God said not to do. Uh, Jacob, he kind of grew up uh, just realizing, hey, um, my dad doesn't really care for me, so I got to get what I can. And so he was a deceiver. He was a manipulator. And he did things uh, to, with his brother that his brother actually let go of his birthright to him, didn't care about it. Um, and uh, eventually his mother helped him when his father was almost about ready to die and, and uh, about ready to give the blessing uh, to the oldest, to his oldest brother to basically make Jacob uh, dressed him in clothing that his, he'd feel like when his dad would touch him, it'd be like uh, his arms were hairy and different things. Anyway, he and his mother did this deception that he stole the blessing that should have went that his older brother was supposed to get. Now let's back up. God said, Jacob was supposed to be the leader, but what happened is that Isaac didn't want to do that, and so this just led to on and on different things and turmoil, where eventually Jacob found himself running away from his family to his uncle Laban. God has a way of even blessing people and saying, you're going to be a great and mighty nation. He has a way, but first, I got to teach you some lessons, and so he taught Jacob some lessons by taking him to his uncle Laban. Uncle Laban in the latter part of Genesis, he was just as much a deceiver as Jacob was. And he shared with Jacob, hey, you stay here and uh, work for me. What do you want? And, and Jacob was in love with his uncle Laban's uh, youngest daughter. And he said, I will work for you for six years um, to marry your youngest daughter. And so Bible says that uh, because he loved um, his his future wife so much that uh, the six days, excuse me, the six years seemed like, like nothing to him. So his wedding night, uh, Uncle Laban got him drunk. And instead, and when he woke up in the morning, instead of the daughter that he loved, it was the oldest daughter and her name was Leah. And, uh, you know, Jacob comes out, what have you done? I don't know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think that right after Jacob said that to his Uncle Laban, you've deceived me. I, I kind of think he may have thought, oh, this is what I did to my family. This is what I did to my brother Esau. Whether or not um, he grew and the family grew, the sad fact is that, and so Laban did give uh, his youngest daughter to Jacob, and Jacob worked another six years, but there was turmoil with, with his uncle, but God blessed Jacob and not Laban and different things. And scripture says that pretty much Jacob, he, he did not treat Leah, even though she was his wife and God, you know, told him he learned stuff through his father and his great grand, his grandfather, Abraham, how he's supposed to treat his wife. He treated her. He didn't love her. He didn't, he really didn't care for her, but God blessed her with children. So an incident comes up in this passage that one of Leah's sons goes out and gets these mandrakes. And if you can read that in the passage, and what it is is a sad situation. That instead of trusting God, uh, Leah and Rachel, the, the two sisters who were warring against each other over 
Jacob's love, um, they, uh, they believe in superstition. And if you study about mandrakes, there's all these things about how it was to, to help in certain, certain areas for um, medical and also superstitious that if you had mandrakes, it would bless you with children. And here's the thing that um, Rachel was barren. She wasn't having kids. And so she thought by having these, uh, getting these back from Leah so that it would superstitiously help her to have children. And so they did this agreement and Jacob went to Leah and they were intimate and Issachar was born. Kind of crazy, kind of confusing, sad, but that was the life he was born into. And yet Leah said this about her son. He said, said God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. And so she named him Issachar. And so where that happens is that once again, like his grandfather and like his father, servants were given the wives when they stopped bearing children, they would give their servants, uh, female servants to have kids. And it just, once again, sharing this all with you, it was a hot mess. Uh, but even through this, God, God grew and blessed Jacob. So Issachar was born into that. So here's Issachar, what he's born into. And then we jump into the future when they're uh, <clears throat> all the brothers. This time there's 12 of them and they're older, they're adults. They're, uh, they realize here's the same thing as Pat, this legacy. They have a brother named Joseph and Joseph is liked more than any of, of the other brothers. They know this because how um, Jacob is treating him. And so a sad fact is that when Joseph goes out to check on the brothers, they decide to kill him. And they, you know, Reuben says, no, don't do that. Uh, one of the brothers, let's just throw him in a well and we'll talk about it. And when they threw him in the well, then later on, these uh, <clears throat> slave traders came and they sold their own brother into slavery. Through all of this, Issachar didn't say anything. He didn't speak. He didn't talk. He didn't say, hey, stop, stop. Um, and so that shows his character a little bit, like all the other brothers. Um, yet what we're going to see is the blessing that Jacob gives them. So if you're unfamiliar with the story, uh, a great famine hits. The boys have to go to Egypt. God had blessed Joseph. You can read that towards the end of the book of Genesis and makes him a uh, ruler second command over all of Egypt. The brothers come, Joseph tests them, and he reunites with his father. And even after all this, um, uh, towards the end of Jacob's life, he's going to give a, a blessing to the boys. And he comes and he has some blessings to these men. And to his older sons, he talks about how violent and, and cruel they were. And pretty much he just says, you guys are going to be be dispersed and gone throughout the tribe of Israel. And he shares that Judah is actually going to lead. And he goes on and talks about the other tribes and the areas they live. And he gets down to Issachar and he says this passage, excuse this blessing in Genesis chapter 49, verses 14 through 15. He says, Issachar is a raw bone donkey lying down among the sheep pens where he sees how good it is excuse me, where he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land. He will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. So you might think, okay, Russ, you gave us this history. And we're talking about the tribe of Issachar. The tribe was Issachar named after some guy whose dad called him a raw bone donkey. So we're going to learn how to be uh, their characteristics from some guy whose dad blessed him as a raw bone donkey. No. So, at first glance, you can look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's, um, <laughs> you know, his dad really didn't care for him. But what I want to share with you is Jacob was blessing Issachar with high value because they were agriculture <clears throat> was the main source of income and how they survived. And a donkey was compared like an ox. Um, raw boned in Hebrew also means strong and also Issachar is also his name in Hebrew, means reward. And so um, some biblical commentaries, they, they share this, is that 
Um, strong built uh, was a characteristic, partic particularly adapted for carrying burdens, pointed to the fact that this tribe would content itself with material, with, with material goods, devote itself to the labor and burden of agriculture, and not strive after political power and rule. The, the figure also indicates this blessing of Jacob that Issachar would become a robust, powerful race of people and receive a pleasant inheritance, which would, inv which would invite to comfortable response. That means Issachar, who didn't stand up for his brother, which was a bad characteristic. The other part was, hey, you know what? I'm about taking care of the people that God's given me. I'm about the inheritance that God has given me. So one had, like all of us, there's a negative side. We say, Lord, help us in this area. But there is this strength that Jacob saw in Issachar that he was a burden bearer, that they would be content with the agriculture and not trying to strive like some of the other tribes to be, hey, we want to have rulers. We want to have influence. And so it's because of this, too, is that we also want to look at, let's talk about strong, strong built is, yeah, he did say like a donkey. And, um, but I want to share in bio, the, you know, a donkey, like an ox has value. And so in Exodus 23, four, <clears throat> Moses shares, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey, same value, wandering off, be sure to return it. Now, it's your enemy. Why in the world would you want to return some? Well, because it was, help them to survive. And so is commanded, whether they're your friend, your enemy or whatever, if you see their livestock, ox or donkey, you return it to them. And as I shared before, a donkey is used to bear burdens in the Bible. An interesting story is uh, also in the book of Numbers about Balaam's donkey. And so you've chosen to listen to me today and, and as your pastor and friend, I want to share with you that what I'm about to say is I truly believe this happened because God is great enough to do this. So in the Bible, there's a story of a false prophet, Balaam's donkey in, in Numbers 22, where he is going off. This king wants to pay him to put a curse on the people of Israel. And so Balaam is on his donkey, and as he's going, the donkey like slams against the wall and crushes his foot and does some more injury to him. And eventually the donkey just collapses down the ground, won't go anymore. And so Balaam starts beating the donkey. This is after God told Balaam in a vision that before, don't go do this. But he went on. And so here's something to share with you in Numbers 22, 23. God sends an angel. The, the donkey saw this angel. God sends an angel to divert Balaam's path on the road to Moab. Balaam can't see it, but apparently his donkey can. It keeps veering off the path, so its owner keeps beating it. After the third beating, the donkey turns to him and speaks, asking why Balaam keeps beating him. God opens Balaam's eyes, and he sees the angel on the road. The road's sword is drawn. Then Balaam, then Balaam repents. The angel tells him to continue to Moab, but instead of a curse, God tells him to say a blessing. So I want to share with you as a Christ follower in this passage, what says, hey, do you literally believe, I literally believe this story because God is big enough to do it. And so there's significance in that story. And look at that. Also, a donkey fulfilled prophecy of the Messiah. And we look at this in, in how the prophecy of the donkey was built is that we see <clears throat> Excuse me, in this pat in Zechariah 9 9, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Here's the prophecy, excuse me, in Zechariah 9 9, in Old Testament. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And so that's describing how Jesus is going to, to come into Jerusalem. And um, we see this in Matthew 21, 2 through 7. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there and a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. 
If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazarene in Galilee. And so we look at this how, as a burden bearer, how Issachar was, <clears throat> that was his characteristic, the burden bearer for taking on and understanding the times to help the nation of Israel. The great example that we follow where Issachar, the tribe, eventually grew into this, into this blessing of Jacob, is that God is our great burden bearer. In Psalm 68, 19, praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily, are you hearing this? Not just every once in a while, who daily bears our burdens. That means whatever is on our hearts, not, the world is crying out for hope, for to, to see what's happening next. And instead of saying, I can't do this because there's so much stuff going on, we can say, Father, I love you. Help me take my burdens so I can share your blessing with others. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. See, too often we say, oh, I need to relax. I need to try to figure something out. And we choose habits or things that are destructive to us when we think they're going to relax and help us. When really God says, come to me, come to me and just spend this time with me and I will give you the rest you seek. And so we look at this too in Galatians 5.1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And also the description of the Good Samaritan, scripture says, in helping the man who was wounded on the road, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Finally, Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And so our heavenly father showed us this. He also showed it through physically becoming down this earth as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ carries our burden. And I want to read this in Luke 23, 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Serene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Jesus was unable to carry the cross because of the beating and torture and stuff that he suffered for you and I. He carried our sins across the Calvary. And then also in Jesus carrying our sins, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Therefore, he fixed his eyes on a horrible death for you and I. And so our Heavenly Father is our burden bearer. Jesus Christ carries our burdens. And so what's our response? What's our response? And, and we'll look at in this passage I want to share with you is that brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, the Apostle Paul is writing this, sharing, sharing with us about how we are to carry each other's burdens. And as I read this scripture, there's nothing here that says, well, carry each other's burdens and look out for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, except if this happens. Nope. Because it says God carries our burdens. And so this is how we carry one another's burdens. 
Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, <clears throat> you who live by spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Everyone should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instructions in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man, a person reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh they will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will receive eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So the Apostle Paul right there is sharing with us just some steps that we can do to, to give people hope, to restore their faith. So the word we look at restore in that scripture. There there are folks throughout my life in ministry and things that I've where uh, we've made mistakes, we've stumbled, and we have got to stop being a church that's like, oh, hey, you know, they blew it. I'm glad that didn't happen to me. Our our spiritual maturity cannot be marked by someone else where they're at, where they're failure, failures. Our spiritual maturity needs to be marked and measured by Jesus Christ and Him alone. The closer we get to Jesus, the more darkness is revealed. And praise God, that's when the awareness comes. We say, okay, Father, here it is. Forgive me. Take it from me. And so we're to restore people with relationship, but we're to watch out. We're to be careful. Restoring someone doesn't mean, I mean the, the biggest lie is, well, I need to be a drug addict so that I can help another drug addict. No, I'm a vessel. I'm a carrier of Jesus Christ. And so we're to watch ourselves, not to get caught up in things, not to be of the world, but to examine our lives. And when we begin to say, Father, here's someone they need restored, it may be your neighbor. You may be hearing a lot of things that people are saying, man, I just don't know what's going to happen uh, tomorrow or what's going to happen about, um, you know, with this pandemic or what's going to happen with our country. Well, what is it? Do we say, yeah, me neither. I don't know. Or can we offer them hope through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and share with them about how, you know, for me, I lay my burdens down with Jesus. And so I'm sharing with you is that we're to restore and we can do that and to help and give people hope. And we're to watch and examine ourselves and to carry each other's burdens, just like Issachar. The key to here today is to be a people of awareness, to be a people of understanding for the times, is it's not me, it's Jesus Christ. And to have the Holy Spirit and be aware that the Holy Spirit works within me and God speaks to me through his word and to share the blessings he's given us with others. And that blessing is relationship with Jesus Christ. And to be able to carry each other's burdens. I want to share with you over the last <clears throat> several weeks or, week or so, there's been things that's like, man, this is overwhelming, but praise God, he says, all you got to do, Russ, is stop and pray. Some people get like, oh, no, we got to do more. No, it's just stop and seek our Father, and he promises to give us that wisdom. And so if you're at a point saying, well, I want to help people and do stuff, but things are just too overwhelming, I hear you. I'm not trying to minimize that, but I'm sharing with you is, is everything else working out for you. And I'm sharing that we've got to stop running to this or just saying, I'm going to be isolated. Or I'm just going to hold up or um, even saying, yeah, I'm not going to spend time in God's word. I'm just too tired, different things. And I want to share with you, please just stop and say, Father, this is overwhelming. This is hard. Help me. Help me to be a person because there are people out there that you are valuable to, you influence, and they need you. They need to hear the blessings and power of hope that's found in Jesus Christ. To continue that is that just as the scripture says, we've got to examine ourselves every day. And I'll share with you that we are not going to be a people of understanding or awareness if we don't take time to say, you know, um, Lord, how am I doing? Father, 
what are some areas in my life that uh, you want me to give more to you and to help you with? It's, it's not he's up there having a, a, you know, a checklist of guilt. He's up there with his arms open wide. He's right here and present with us and saying, I'm here. I love you. Examine your heart and life and let's get rid of this stuff. And God will give you the plan. It's like, you know, I'm lonely. Well, seek God and he'll give you relationships. <clears throat> it's like I'm frustrated about relationships in my family. Well, God understands that. Who greater to mend those relationships than God? You know, and so there's these things like, what do I do about uh, <clears throat> what's going to happen uh, tomorrow? God says, don't worry about tomorrow. I got it taken care of. There's enough stuff for today. Trust me for today. And so we are to sow when we exist to please the spirit. And what I'm sharing with you is God is spirit, Jesus Christ. They reside with us, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And our comforter to be able to show us, here's how you have peace. Here's the way to go. Here's the way that you can have peace in your life and give that peace to others. And the key is carrying each other's burdens. Do good to each other. Do good. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. You and I become a people who understand the times and know what to do when we follow the example of our Heavenly Father who carries our burdens and frees us to carry other burdens. The people of Issachar were not some mystical, magical kind of beings. They were ordinary people like you and I, whose founder had was born into a hot mess, raised in a hot mess, participated in his own brother being sold into slavery, yet God grew a people from him that influenced and supported the nation of Israel in troubling times. God can do that through you and I as a church family, as believers, if we seek him. And if we become a people, that father, with everything else going on, we trust you. Help us to be burden bearers. And in that, we realize how much God carries our burdens each day. I love you all very much. We're going to finish with a, a song. Grace is going to finish the recording and go do a, a final song. And uh, then we'll just spend some time as much as you want to and just uh, um, sharing at the end. I love you all. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for my church family. During these troubling times, Father, even just things happening individually with us. We, we seek you and we ask for your help. Help us to be the burden bearers, just as the people of Issachar uh, became for their nation. And Lord, in that, we truly realize the blessings of how much you carry our burdens each day. We love you and praise you, Lord. Amen.